All right. Uh, I think it's time we should get started and um, uh, respect everyone's time, um, their lunch time. Um, and then Adriana, if you can, okay, great. We're we're going to record the session too, so um, we will be all set uh, in case anyone misses it or if you'd like to share it, we'll end up posting it on our Maddie YouTube page and probably on LinkedIn. So um, just to start off, I just want to say welcome everyone on this Thursday afternoon, uh, 2021, after a very powerful day yesterday, we're excited to keep momentum up and to really jump into our spring semester at SMU. Um, I am Jessica Burnham. I am the Director of Design and Innovation Programs here at, um, at Southern Methodist University um, in the MADI program, which is the Master of Arts in Design and Innovation. Uh, we are so lucky that we, as a program, we are a graduate program that is a joint effort between the Lyle School of Engineering and the Meadows School of the Arts. Um, and we have this really great opportunity to partner with a designer uh, that we call our designer in resident every semester. And so what you are attending today and participating in today is this great public event. We get to highlight that person and that designer. So I am so excited to introduce Nadine Deshose, who is our eighth designer in resident. Um, that we have gotten to kind of come alongside and learn directly from. Nadine um, helped work the way our pro this program works with this, the designers is that they commit to around 10 hours a week to hovering with our classes and giving direct feedback, mentorship, opening up their contact list, their calendar, and really just jumping in and being a part of our Maddie family. Uh, Nadine got to we got the privilege of her feedback and constant guide, guidance and leadership with our studio class last semester that was with Dallas College's Labor Market Intelligence Center. Um, and it was just such an, a great joy to be able to work on these great projects. And then Nadine always came in with a, but you need to know this person and this person and this person and this person and just really connecting the network for us and our students. So um, I would love to introduce Nadine officially and then we're gonna let Nadine kind of take the show. The format for this event is that Nadine will, uh, she has some things that she'll cover on her own. Her and I will have a bit of a conversation, but we would love for you all to utilize the chat with questions. We'll save them for the end um, and can kind of navigate that as we go through towards the end of the session. So we'll have plenty of time for qu question and answer. We would ask that everyone stays muted until the very end um, and then we'll chime in. And, and if we need further explanation about questions, we'll ask you or anything like that. Uh, so let's jump in. So Nadine is, um, a former senior research associate and director of the Center of Applied Behavioral Science at MDRC in New York City. In that capacity, she led national projects that integrated design, behavioral economics, and rigorous testing to improve service delivery and government programs, authored several studies, and developed trainings to help teams use behavioral science and communications. Nadine came to Texas in 2018 to lead grant make making from the $400 million W.W. Carruth Jr. Fund at Communities Foundation of Texas. As a grant maker, she champions equity, access, evidence, and participatory approaches. She recently transitioned to the role of Director of Learning and Insights, where she is focused on building a strategic learning function and supporting the nonprofit community in using data and design to improve outcomes. Nadine completed her undergraduate education at Brown University. She earned her JD and MA degrees in criminology and human development and applied psychology from the University of Toronto. She enjoys spinning podcasts and I can relate to this boy mom life. So we have a lot of fun chats about our young boys. So Nadine, I would love to kick it off to you and um, let you take it from here. Thank you so much. All right. So I will share my screen and we will get started. I need all of my concentration to do this correctly. Okay, so hi everybody. Thank you so much for coming to this. I am truly honored to have the opportunity to deliver this um, public session to you. Um, I had a great experience working over the last semester with the Maddie master's students uh, who you know, I, I learned a lot from, because as you heard from Jessica, my training is as an applied behavioral scientist. And it, it really gave me an opportunity to continue to think about a question that, that actually is the question we're gonna discuss today, which is what is the connection between applied behavioral science, what may call behavioral economics and human-centered design? Um, how might we 
uh, really build a bridge, a better bridge between these uh, disciplines or these two approaches. So let's jump right in. And, and is everyone seeing my screen well? Is this working? Okay, great. Yeah, you're good. Um, okay, because I, I do have a bunch of things popping up on my screen. Okay, so if we were to create a genealogical design tree, like the one that you see in front of you, um, human-centered design and behavioral economics would both be on it, and they would be close to each other. You know, uh, in fact, they're actually, these two approaches to design are exactly the same age. They're about 15 or so years old. It kind of emerged at the same time. Um, they use very similar uh, techniques. But the question that we're going to explore in this conversation is, you know, what is the relationship really between these two branches of design that place humans at the center? And more importantly, what should it be? You know, this is a question that, as I said, I, I thought a lot about because these two social technologies of innovation um, and creative problem solving bear a lot of similarities. They are applied in similar situations, particularly relating to improving the performance of social services. But there is a strange distance between them. Uh, so you mostly hear about people practicing either human-centered design or behavioral science, behavioral economics. And for example, many of the graduates of this wonderful design program uh, probably know very little about behavioral economics, even though it has spurred a human-centered design revolution in public policy. So that's what we're here to tackle. Now, before I move on, I feel like I have to address the question of this other branch <laughs> that is clearly on this tree, somewhere between these two, of service design. Um, so that service design clearly fits into this framework somewhere between human-centered design and behavioral economics. According to Form 1, which is a consulting firm that specializes in designing digital experiences, service design focuses on mapping each touch point an individual has with a service provider in order to improve their experience and create a positive relationship between the two. So, you know, human-centered design can be applied to anything. We can apply it to strategy. You know, I personally, and I know many of my colleagues at CFT are trying to apply it to philanthropy. Um, the distinction here is that service design is very much focused on service delivery. And that is actually also the space where BE tends to live on um, service design or product design. Um, and so, the, but the real difference between BE and service design is that the science of decision making is an in, in, in a really intrinsic part of behavioral economics, as you're going to hear. So, I'm going to start with a brief definition of human centered design, which is also known as design thinking. Um, I, I remember having an intense conversation with uh, Jessica's predecessor on the distinction between these two terms. And I feel like I still don't know what it is. So, you know, that is something if you know, please put it in the chat. But I do think the terms are used rather interchangeably. So, you know, we'll, we'll maybe do that in this conversation. Um, and then I'm gonna introduce you to behavioral economics. That's where the bulk of our discussion is going to be. And, as, and behavioral economics also goes by a lot of different names. And that's because most of us who practice it are not economists we are trained in something else. So, you know, my training, as you heard, is in psychology and sociology and program evaluation. Um, again, this is true of a lot of the folks who work in this field. And um, sometimes we also talk about uh, behavioral diagnosis and design, and I will use that term as well. And then we will do a comparison of the two, and I will invite you to participate in that part. So human-centered design. Even though it existed before Tim Brown, we generally associate this field with Tim, Dr Tim Brown, the chair of IDEO and author of a few books on design and the very influential design thinking article in the Harvard that was published in the Harvard Business Review in 2008. Brown describes human-centered design as a process that starts with people you're designing for and ends with new solutions that are purpose-built to suit their needs. 
I, I absolutely love that turn of phrase and, you know, think that it encapsulates what human centered design is all about, you know, rather than building a process for the system to meet the system needs or to meet the needs of the employees who work within an organization, we are focused on building that system to meet the needs of our users. Human-centered design is about cultivating deep empathy with the people you're designing for, generating ideas, building a bunch of prototypes, sharing what you've made with the people you're designing for, and eventually putting your innovative solution out into the world. That last part is essentially the roadmap for how to do it. So, you know, what's distinctive about human-centered design as a design practice is that it's highly experimental. You know, there's the solution that you're, you're building um, pre-implementation is one that you play with. You may build, you know, versions of the thing that you would ultimately like to test or scale um, so that people can really engage with it. Now, human-centered design, as we know, has a storied history of creating consumer products most famously the mouse and um, the cruising bike. I don't know if many folks know that second one. So that bike that you kind of step into um, is uh, the product of a collaboration between IDEO and a bike manufacturing company. But technically, again, human-centered design can be applied to anything from services to strategy. Um, it deploys a dynamic set of tools, techniques, and mindsets. I, I recently took out a few books about human-centered design and preparation for this uh, event. And so many of the, the books that are written in this field are really just a menu of tools uh, and techniques that you can use, not necessarily prescribing a particular approach. And um, because you know, the, the whole idea is that what tools you end up using or needing are, are, is really determined by the context. There's also a real focus on mindset. So, you know, in human-centered design processes, we're thinking about how to create a space, a set of norms, um, a, a way of thinking and, and doing that enables us to come up with creative solutions, to take risks and to innovate. And we typically think about the markers for a successful effort in this area in terms of desirability, feasibility, and viability. And so while the process is highly dynamic and nonlinear, um, Tim Brown and other practitioners talk about human-centered design process as going through three spaces, um, which are laid out here. So the space of understanding, the space of ideation, and the space of implementation. And as you can see within that, there are specific steps that, that we tend to go through. So the first step, of course, that step of building empathy with our users through observation uh, solutions or problems that, that folks are facing are often inspired by that very direct observation. We tell stories, sometimes we create personas of you know, the users who are working their way through our programs and systems. And then we synthesize those insights and use them as fodder for the ideation process, for brainstorming. Um, and there are a set of you know, practices that we can incorporate to uh, generate better ideas, to avoid closing the ideation stage too early. We create concepts, we, we resolve or, you know, kind of consolidate around a particular type of prototype that we'd like to test. And then we put it into the field, get feedback from our users, test and refine it. And ultimately the goal is to scale, spread and sustain and of course, there's a lot of feedback loops that um, happen within this process. So I'm assuming that all of what I've said thus far is pretty familiar to 90% of the folks who have dialed into this, uh, to this webinar. Now let me transition to the behavioral economics description. So I've listed here the patron saints of um, behavioral economics. If, if Tim Brown is the patron saint of, of human-centered design, Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler are uh, the patron saints of the behavioral economics movement. And that is because they are the authors of a really influential book also published in 2008 called Nudge. 
Um, these two professors, one a professor of law, the other a professor of economics, created a sensation by repackaging existing insights, mostly from other researchers. And the two researchers listed on the right are the, the most prominent among them, Danny Kahneman and Amos Tversky, these Israeli psychologists who had been cataloging all the ways that um, human behavior deviates from the expectations of rationality. So the book Nudge took aim at economists who design public policy. You know, economists had been assuming that people are rational utility maximizers, but as I mentioned, Kahneman and, and Tversky and many others, including Richard Thaler, who is an experimental economist, um, had demonstrated time and again that we are not. And what Nudge says is that that has profound implications. So at the heart of BE are three central insights. The first is that design is everywhere and it is never neutral. So we are all familiar with this concept of design, designing a space, designing a park. You know park is working if people show up and use the, uh, the, the materials, the playground, the fields. But we also design messages. So right now in the midst of this big push to get folks vaccinated, and you may know that uh, the Department of Health and Human Services is setting aside a pretty significant budget for marketing, for addressing um, hesitancy among, uh, you know, especially key populations in receiving the vaccination. So we have to think about how do we design the communication in a way that might compel people to uh, get the vaccine. And then we design forms. Um, so those of us who work in the nonprofit sphere or who work in organizations are very familiar with this aspect of design. You have to design the manner in which a program is delivered both from enrollment to graduation. And all of the parts that go along with that are design opportunities. So, you know, what these authors are telling us is that there is a better and a worse way to design all of these things. Now, you might say, those of you especially who have a background in graphic design, that the better way to design them is to make them beautiful. And certainly you have a point there. I mean, that is part of the work. But, the, but what's important that they are pointing out to us is that beauty is not enough. Um, in fact, the value, the objective value of the thing that is being designed is also not enough. And it's not enough because of the second insight that the human users of products and services that we're designing are predictably irrational. So uh, the human in the behavioral economics branch of human-centered design is an irrational creature. And by this, I mean that we are subject to countless cognitive and behavioral biases, quirks of thinking and acting that operate in a consistent way. For example, we are biased towards the present, which means it's hard to resist temptations, even if we know we should. Um, we are also, we have an availability bias. It makes us worry about risks that are rare and spectacular rather than those that are more prevalent but mundane. And any, if you go into you know, Google and type in you know, anomalies or cognitive biases, as you will hear, as you might, you know, a term that you might also hear, there is a very long list of them. Um, and so we tend to categorize them along three verticals. So we have issues around bounded rationality, the notion that unlike Spock, we do not have kind of an infinite capacity to weigh pros and cons and, you know, think about all the various variables um, in a particular situation and figure out what's best for us. We also have bounded self-control. So when we are hungry, when we are um, pressed for time or stress, um, you know, when the day, it's towards the, the end of the day, we often have challenges, um, you know, repressing some of our impulses and doing the things that we know are right for us to do. And then we have bounded self-interest, meaning that, you know, we are, we are very likely to do what our friends and family members are doing and not what is in our specific self-interest. 
we also know from, from work in psychology and sociology that race, gender, material wealth, power, all of these factors have predictable effects on people. For example, we know that the experience of scarcity, not having enough money, not having it, you know, friends or time, um, things that we've all experienced during the pandemic, interferes with our cognitive functioning in, in predictable ways. Uh, <clears throat> we know that stereotype threat uh, exists and you know, operates in a context when we're asked as people who have a particular identity to do something for which there's negative stereotype for our group. So knowing what we do, the third insight from behavioral economics is that we should be designing to help people overcome these behavioral traits and to make it easier for the greatest number of them to achieve the outcome. The slide here is just this idea that, you know, we are trying to get people from point A, the top of the slide to point B as quickly and efficiently as possible. Um, and that should be our purpose. You know, the, the subtitle of the book Nudge is improving decisions about health, wealth, and happiness. Um, and, and what the book suggests is that we can use the knowledge we have gained from fields like psychology, sociology, and marketing to help us do that. So there are two side, sides to the coin of the psychology of design, the topic of this discussion. We have the behavioral quirks that are throwing up barriers to people achieving their best interest. And then we have psychological insights about which environmental factors facilitate good outcomes. So a good example of this is in the area of choice. Sheena Iyengar, a psychologist, identified the problem of choice overload, a kind of paralysis that strikes us when we have too many choices. Um, so paralyzed by too many choices. This is a you know, phenomenon um, that we have seen in different contexts. So she constructed a clever experiment to look at this. She set up a display in a uh, fancy supermarket with different varieties of jam. She wanted to see under what conditions people would be more likely to purchase a, a, a jar of jam. So on one day she would have uh, a relatively small number of options, six jars of jam. And then on an alternating week, she would have 24. And she just very objectively counted how many people stop and look at the, the jars of jam, how many people purchase um, jam. And what she found is that more people visited and sampled the display when there were a large number of options, but they were more likely to purchase when there were fewer. So there are a couple of design points that I think are important to underline here. Um, first is that we may assume that more choice is better for people. So for example, if we were in the HR department and we're designing, you know, the 401k options or healthcare options, we might say, let's provide our employees as many choices as possible, because that would be in their best interest. And what we see here is that that is in fact not the case, that that assumption is based on a rational ex expectation about what humans will do, and we just dis discussed that humans are not quite rational. Um, the other thing that I think is important for us to think about is that if we were just using the number of people who visited the, uh, the display as a proxy for the number who would purchase JAM, then we would have come, up, come to the wrong conclusion about how to design this display since there was more interest in the, in the uh, display that had more jars of jam. And that kind of speaks to how important it is in our design work to not just prototype, right? But to in fact, use the prototype to test some hypotheses and then run a full implementation test to determine what, whether or not your users actually achieve the outcome of interest. And in that jam example, it was purchasing the jam. In the, in the behavioral economics framework, designers are accountable for producing positive outcomes for program users. This is so central to the enterprise that we measure it. Okay, so all of the things that the tests that I'm about to tell you about involved an evaluation to figure out if the design actually worked. And, you know, this 
as a, a moment just caused me to ask myself, well, how do we evaluate the success of design work in the human centered design field? So, you know, how do you know if you've done a good job? Is it that we've come up with a novel solution, so enabled an organization to do something new that it had not done before? Um, is it feasibility? Is it market adoption? Uh, what are the metrics for success? And I'm going to leave you with to think about that as I tell you about the two BE examples that I promised to share. So these two examples <clears throat> demonstrate the two poles of the behavioral economics field from the years about, of about 2010 to 2018 when I was an active participant in it. Um, I got started in the field of behavioral science in uh, 2010, right at its inception. MDRC, where I worked, um, won the first big contract to take the ideas from Nudge and to see how they might be applied to improve federally funded human services programs, programs like child support and um, the child care subsidy program. So I managed the team for that effort and ran five of the experiments in Indiana and New York. And then I went on to manage two other federally funded behavioral science projects. Um, and to lead the Center for Applied Behavioral Science. So I'm gonna talk about one project that was done by a New York City-based behavioral design firm called Ideas42. And in the, it was in the criminal justice field. And then talk about the last field experiment that I led at MDRC um, in Colorado, which was published in 2019. That second intervention uses concepts from uh, uh, around communication design, which you will see are really central in the Ideas 42 test, but also goes beyond that, that. So why don't people show up for court when they receive a criminal summons? That is the question that the Ideas 42 team was confronted with um, in, in their work. The no-show rate is significant. It's in many, in some cases, it's as much as 40%, it could be even 50% at various times of year. And the consequences are serious, including having a warrant for one's arrest issued. The standard assumption is that people who do not show up are actively defying the criminal justice system. And therefore the only logical response to failure to appear is ratcheting up the punishment. The team from Ideas 42, however, took a behavioral view. And so they looked for a cause related to program design um, rather than looking for a flaw in people. And you know that there's probably a program issue going on because you have such large and systemic failure rates or no-show rates. So if you think about a program being purpose-built for its audience, um, you ask yourself, how strong is the fit between the demands of this process or the messages that are being communicated and the cognitive or behavioral needs of the users. So the process that behavioral designers go through to design a solution in this context is fairly systematic. It's called behavioral diagnosis and design. And this is a representation of it. It starts with define. So in the define stage, you use data to quantify the behavioral outcome that you're trying to improve. Um, again, that outcome is always related to improving well-being for your customers. And so we, in fact, choose the settings in which we do behavioral projects by whether or not there are very good data about what about the, the target behavior and all the steps prior to achieving that ultimate outcome. And then you move into the diagnose stage. So at that stage, we always create a map of the process and which shows all of the touch points leading up to the targeted behavioral outcome, all of the stakeholders involved and the constraints that the system is facing. And this again, just hearkening back to the start of this presentation is really similar to what service designers would do in creating that map with all of the touch points on it. The difference here is that as a behavioralist, you're looking for friction between the program and the user, which behavioral scientists would call bottlenecks. That leads us into an ideational stage, um, the design stage, where you use behavioral theories to redesign the process 
using also evidence and you know psychological theory to try to counteract the bottlenecks. And then very importantly, you test your solution. So you use a strong evaluation method to determine if service if the service design change has actually improved the targeted outcome. So when researchers from Ideas 42 mapped the process by which defendants are informed that they need to attend court, they found that uh, the summons that police officers in New York were distributing was very poorly designed. And it was pretty much the only touch point between you know, being told by a police officer that they need to go to court and the court date. So it was incredibly important. The original design um, is shown here. I, I realize it's not that easy to see, but um, when, they, when they dug into it, they found that um, this document placed the time and the place of a court appearance right at the bottom under some other irrelevant information. And so that led to a hypothesis. They hypothesized that maybe people don't attend court because they don't see the notification or they forget. Um, and so they redesigned this boring administrative notice and they did so with a two-arm test. One of their, one aspect of their redesign was to change the summons. So police officers were, were issued a new pad of summonses that just looked slightly different. And some of the changes that they made were to change the title. So instead of calling it complaint slash information, they called it criminal court appearance ticket, more and a more active phrasing that explains what this is for. Um, they moved the court date and time to the top, knowing that there's often attentional issues. People don't often make it to the end of the thing that you've um, told them to read. So, but they, they often do read what's at the top, especially at the top left. So they put that key information there. They clearly indicated which court the person had to go to, and then also highlighted the consequences of missing the court date. They had another arm of this test where they sent out some text message reminders um, at three different time periods right before the court date. And this gave them an opportunity to test different messages and also different hypotheses about why people were not showing up. So they had a consequence text, which is the one that you're seeing right here, um, where it emphasizes that the reason to attend court is to avoid an arrest warrant. Um, they had a plan making test uh, or text where the language focused on um, being sure that folks knew where the court date, where the court was located, um, had an appoint, had a, a reminder set in their own calendars and brought the materials that they needed. And then they had a combo, which had some of the language from the consequence uh, text and some of the language from the plan making text. And they found that the combo and, co and consequence texts um, performed the best. And so you can see here that both of these interventions, just changing the design of the summons, um, improves uh, show, show rates. So you can see with the redesigned form, you have reduced by about seven percentage points the failure to appear rates. And then in the second intervention, which was only delivered for folks who offered to get to give a police officer their um, their phone number, their cell phone number, they were able to still improve the uh, show rate even further. And they found this by running a randomized controlled trial evaluation so that they could know with certainty um, that these interventions do in fact change the targeted behavior. Both uh, these changes together led to about 30,000 fewer arrest warrants over a three year period. So I think what's important to, to, to really note here is how inexpensive this is um, and, and so worthwhile based on these results. But let's also be clear that we didn't solve the problem of failure to appear, right? We've reduced it and it's worth it to do it because the cost is not too great. But we certainly did not solve it um, because there still are other reasons why people fail to appear. So the question for me, and I'd love to get some reaction to this, is, you know, how would this, 
have been different, this design have been different. If the designer was not a practitioner of behavioral economics, but of human centered design. Um, and I'm just going to open it up to see if anybody has any thoughts on that. Hey, Dean, I didn't hear you say, did you actually talk with people that had gotten summonses or did you just simply change the form and send it out? So there was, there were interviews, yes, mm -hmm. at the front end to <laughs> kind of understand what, what, how people were reading the, mm -hmm. the summons form. I think on, on that note with Regina, I think to jump in a little, <clears throat> one of my thoughts was one, how, how, what is the follow-up to? So like the controlled uh, group at the end to kind of really see, did it, did it come through because of the form, but were there any like people who showed up? Did, were those people asked, why did you come? Or did anyone actually reference the new design of the form? Does anyone actually feel that? Because I do think there's this sense of a lot of times you can say good design is invisible design and that we mm -hmm. don't even notice it almost. And so that we can kind of just tell that it's, we just, we did what we were supposed to kind of thing because of that information. Um, so I think that would be kind of interesting to know too. Yeah, so this is where the design method, I mean, the study methodology really comes into play. There, This was tested with a randomized control trial evaluation. So in some ways you don't need to ask people if the, the, the design is what motivated the behavior because you're seeing on average that people who received the different, the, the new notice came more, you know, more reliably to court. And that because of the random assignment, the two groups, those who got that notice and those who got the other ones are the same, okay. you know, on all unobservable and observable characteristics. So, you know, I thought about this, uh, this one for a moment, and it, I actually think that someone who's practicing human centered design would very likely have had a similar reaction to the note to the summons. Um, because, you know, what I've seen with the, the students that, you know, I've worked closely with and, uh, and you, Jessica, is that there is a real um, emphasis on clarity. We want communication, whatever it is, to um, to be very salient and, you know, easy to process. Um, and so I think that we would have all come to the conclusion that putting the most critical information on the bottom and kind of burying it was the wrong decision. And we needed to, to flip that. But there were some aspects of this design that are very much motivated by the behavioral point of view. And in particular, that um, that decision to highlight the consequences of failing to appear. Um, that comes from an area of psychological research called loss aversion, where we know that people are more motivated to uh, change their behavior when they are at risk of suffering a loss, as opposed to when they have the opportunity to obtain a gain of the same amount. Um, so that piece may not have have been there. Um, so let's keep let's keep moving forward. And and by the way, if you were putting something in the chat, I don't have the chat open. Uh, feel free to come off mute and, and interrupt me. Yeah, there's a couple questions here I can kind of reiterate too. Is um, Sarah brought up curiosity about other barriers to showing up to court? You have reduced the form as a barrier to entry. What else could be tweaked to further reduce the no show rate? So I yeah. think that's interesting, that difference between barriers and actual outcomes or the no-show rate too. And then um, Regina brought up, I was uh, about to ask that other parts of the system were impacting the outcome and did the new, and did the new form surface other challenges? And uh, Align also brought up, is there separate research for the no-shows on how they used or did not use the form? So I think lots of good like digging into. I think Absolutely. another thing I was thinking too was um, the language, especially in New York City when English is not the only language obviously, mm. and how does that relate and how are people able to read that in multiple languages too, so. Yeah, I love all these questions because in some ways, redesigning the form and adding a text message was low hanging fruit. 
Yeah. And so you can do this, see how much improvement we get without adding a lot of cost or complexity, and then go after some of those other levels of barriers that likely exist, that's, that do exist because we still have a very significant no-show rate. Um, and okay. it is so important, just sorry to cut you off, to, to get at the people who don't engage and to try to better understand that group. I mean, and so if you think about this process, just like human design centered design is being iterative, you know, we kind of, now we feel like we've maybe addressed a certain community of those who were not showing. And now we need to go after another segment through probably, you know, starting at the beginning and doing another defined diagnose and design test process. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about whether or not there is a difference in the uh, the scientific approach. So I've heard you quote studies and sources and findings and that those are sort of intentionally and easily woven into the work of mm -hmm. behavioral science. I think with design thinking, we certainly do our research in the beginning of any project. I'm I didn't experience the science being as front and center. So, Regina, you're, you're um, skipping to my last slide, which <laughs> is going to make that point. <laughs> um, you know, this is this these that's an essential difference between these two approaches. The behavioral science approach is, is embedded in uh, mm -hmm. research and in that set of precedents, that concept of you know, we are building an understanding of human behavior, of how to engage people in behave, in activities that are beneficial for them. And so to, every time you get a new problem, you have to look back and try to see what the, what we've learned from some of the old problems and then how you can, you know, continue to take the, the work further. So yes, you, you know, you keyed into a major, a major issue here that, you know, evidence is essential to the design process in, in the behavioral framework. All right, so I'm gonna keep going. All right, so why don't people show up, or sorry, why don't people pay their child support orders on time? Um, and those people are called non-custodial parents in the child support system. In, in Colorado, as in many states, there is a large portion of non-custodial parents who miss the first payments um, that are due once they get a new child support order. And they end up in arrears, essentially, you know, in, in bad standing with the child support system, which can lead to a lot of really negative consequences. So we might assume that people who don't pay their child support orders are simply showing contempt for the system or that they don't have the money, they don't have the means to pay. Um, and these factors undoubtedly account for some non-payment. But here again, we, and this again is the test that I directly worked on with the MDRC team and the state of Colorado, we decided to look at this from a behavioral point of view. And um, we thought that there could be a behavioral problem because again, the problem is, of non-payment in the first few months of a, of a child support order is systemic and it's large. So it does suggest that the problem is in some way related to the process. And we, need, we needed to look for clues in the program design. So we targeted our intervention at those counties listed there. And the behavior that we sought to change was to increase on time and full payment in the first few months. Now, um, as I mentioned before, in the diagnosis phase, we develop a process map. And I have a, a version of that um, summarized on a, in that right-hand panel. And in the process map, we're tracking every touch point between the program and customers from establishing an order to making that first payment. We um, talk to staff, we talk to parents, custodial and non-custodial parents during this stage. We observe the process. We collect all of the pieces of paper that are, that are sent out. We even spoke to judges in this, in this test. 
And we found that we could separate parents who pay child support into relevant groups, similar to the notion of constructing personas in human-centered design. We have those who are eligible for what are called income withholding orders. There's essentially um, you know, times when the child support system can grab the amount of the uh, child support order directly out of someone's paycheck. And there are those who aren't because maybe they are paid in cash. And there are those who pay, who can pay their child support orders using electronic bank drafts because they have a bank account. And there are those who do not have bank accounts or, you know, there's not enough money in their bank account for that direct withdrawal. And so they need to pay in cash money order or another means. And so what we saw was that the system wasn't providing enough information to parents and certainly wasn't segmenting parents in the way that I just described to provide the parent with the relevant information. Um, after court, you know, once an order was established, parents were being handed a big stack of court documents that contained the order information, but it had been written by and for lawyers. If they were given individual information, it might have been in front of a judge in a highly charged forum. Um, you know, child support is always tricky because you're dealing with those emotional issues between uh, the custodial parent and the non-custodial parent. And the order itself was actually referenced by the name of the custodial parent instead of the name of the child, um, which, which made the whole situation, again, very emotionally fraught. And none of the information that a, that a non-custodial parent might get was necessarily personalized. So, you know, if you if non-custodial parent asked someone who works in the child support system, how do I pay my child support? Most would just say, send in a check, you know, or money order, or you can pay in cash. And they wouldn't ask the person, for example, how do you pay your utility bills? Do you want to pay your child support in the same way? So we worked on building a user-centered process that um, tries to honor the parent-child relationship, integrate a new routine of making child support payments into the payer's life, and do that in a way that is error-proof. So in, again, in behavioral solutions or behavioral design, you're really aware of all of the trouble that humans have with self-control and sustaining new habits or building new habits. So you're thinking about how can, how can I automate this, if at all possible? How can I, how can I anticipate that um, you know, uh, this person who I'm designing for is gonna have trouble following through on this in the future. And we wanted to ensure that parents understood the risks associated with missing a payment or even of, with underpaying um, their child support. And those, again, those risks were significant. So we created a planning meeting which happened immediately after the order was established. And we tried to incorporate some best uh, practices from the science of goal setting. So there were three elements of this new meeting. One was a infographic um, that we called stay in the green zone. And it walked through a scenario. So John has a $100 monthly order. And we, we showed that, you know, when John is paying $100 on time every month, everything is great. But when John starts paying less than $100, he moves into what we call the yellow zone, where he's at risk of falling into the red zone. And, what, and in the red zone, he starts to lose a driver's license, you know, get a, a negative credit rating. And so what he would need to do is to reach out to his a caseworker to get on a plan for um, getting back into the green zone. And so this was, again, just a way of very simply using kind of visual communication to explain a very important point and to activate loss aversion. We then, uh, and I'm missing a slide here. Okay, I'm missing a slide. Uh, we then created uh, an online decision tool that's not represented here, but um, this is the third element actually of this meeting. The online decision tool basically asked a few questions. It's like a little survey for the individual that asks them how they pay their other bills and try to channel this individual toward a recommendation to pay their child support in, in an automated way um, through some sort of direct withdrawal, if at all possible. We then would, but they could of course overrule the recommendation of the online decision tool 
it was just a way again of pulling the caseworker out of it and giving that um, customer an opportunity to get a neutral uh, recommendation. And then we would um, record the decision that the customer had made about how they would pay their child support in a wallet card, um, like the one that you're seeing. So, you know, this would be folded at all of those panels and um, uh, given to the person so they could put it in, in their wallet. Most non-custodial parents were men. So we, we made this, uh, we designed this in the uh, Denver Broncos colors. And I won't go into all the details, but there are design concepts around decision-making that are built into this document. Um, particularly, you know, the issue, the, the question of timing. So everybody's timing for making their child support payments is different because people are paid on different schedules. So you want to make it really clear to this individual, when do you need to make your payments? And when is the drop dead date by which if you haven't submitted a payment, it's going to be late because it actually takes a few days for payments to be um, recorded and registered. We also very importantly label the payment by the name of the child as opposed to the non-custodial parent. So once again, just as in the Ideas 42 study, we randomly assigned parents to either get the normal process, which you saw in, in that flowchart a few slides ago, or this process with uh, the new meeting, and the results were strong. So we found that parents who received the intervention um, paid more quickly. They uh, paid a larger proportion of their child support orders, and, um, and that was a meaningful difference, $115 in terms of the amount, total amount paid during the first three months. Now we didn't change the absolute number of parents who make payments. So, you know, there may be, again, parents have other barriers. Maybe they can't afford to pay their child support or those resentment and, um, you know, issues that I talked about at the beginning. But for those who have the willingness to pay, we were, and the ability to pay, we were able to um, reduce the number who would experience negative consequences from non-payment. So again, I asked the question, if I had been coming at this problem from a human-centered design approach as opposed to a behavioral science approach, would the result, do you think, have been any different? Feel free to just chime in or throw something in the chat too if you guys like to contribute. Well, I don't have um, an answer to the question, but I do have a question concerning the child support um, project. Yeah, please. The question is this. Does this type of process or study take into account cultural differences? And here's specifically what I'm speaking about regarding child support. There are cultures or races, African-American men in particular, sometimes would prefer to pay the mother, the custodial parent directly because they don't quote, want the man or authorities in their business. Mm -hmm. Does this type of approach take that into account? How would you even know about it? And if you did know about it, would that have changed anything? So this is a great question. Um, and, you know, I will say that for the purpose of this presentation, we're kind of flattening the um, complexity of the process and the people who are part of it. Um, right. Believe me, we, we know that there are cultural, racial problems in the child support system. Um, I mean, I came to think of it as really a system of disciplining a group of men who are not seen as fathers. Right. And, and, you know, using these really coercive means to try to kind of extract um, income from them. So it's very problematic. And I don't want to suggest that we didn't see or understand that. Um, it, it would it have, does it change the design of the project? It could, I think in this case, it didn't. Um, this, this seemed, this, this intervention was 
um, one of those kind of first order, how do you kind of capture as many kind of new payers as you possibly can um, with the low hanging fruit, given how dehumanizing this process was to begin with. And then, you know, again, had we done some additional iterations, we might have gone for segments of the non-custodial parent population to try to better understand that, that group and, you know, design something that is more uh, relevant to them. I mean, I would say that the identity factor that was most relevant in this design process was just that most of these individuals are men. And so we were kind of thinking about men when we were um, doing the design. I have a colleague um, who worked on a similar kind of project in Texas, Dee, who's on the line here. She worked within the Office of the Attorney General. I don't know, Dee, if you want to add anything. That is such a relevant point. And I think that, as Nadine said, our project approached the low hanging fruit, approached the, the, the fringes of who we could reach. And I think in our experiment, which was very similar to Colorado's, something that was salient related to that notion of non custodial parents not wanting to be part of the system is that we did shift the, the framing of what we were doing in the communications from, hey, you deadbeat dad, the law's got to come after you to make you do this, to in the communications, um, dear personalized name, thank you for, for taking part of this on behalf of your child. Um, and just reframing things in terms of we're coming at you with respect um, for you as a parent as opposed to we're coming after you with the law. So mm -hmm. this, that was one attempt to, to take that into consideration. Great answers, thank you. Uh, Nadine, there's also another question too, and maybe David Williams has a question too, but there's um, something too about, what about language or literacy barriers and how that might affect some of this work too. And I know that you're showing all of this. This is this just shows you have a very strong critical thinking group here that everyone's like, what about this? And what about that? So I, I would be interested in any of the language components too that you guys hit on in Colorado. So great question. It's, it's always a first order question in designing communication. Um, so we, we ensure that we are reducing as much as possible the reading level of the documents that we redesign. You know, we often find that they're written at something like a 10th grade level and we want to get it down to like a sixth grade level. And I will say that the other thing that we do by is to use graphics, as you can see with, you know, what's even displayed on the screen here there, we try to move away from um, words only as the way of communicating key information and to use other graphical elements. So, you know, we've designed uh, forms that are going out from bureaucratic organizations, government organizations that are, uh, that have like uh, highlighting on them, that have post note, post it note on them so that we can draw people's attention to the most important information. Uh, there are in some, in some of these studies, uh, bilingual material. So we might translate this exact set of forms to the second most prevalent uh, language that is spoken by, you know, within a particular customer base. I'm pretty sure this material was also available in Spanish in Colorado. Um, and that that's just, you know, again, as we get to know our customers at during the, the define stage, you figure out, you know, what do you kind of need to uh, anticipate when it comes to language. So David, did you have a question? Or yeah, I was going to say, I, I think that tree image at the beginning was uh, well defined for how close these two fields are. And I'm looking for maybe where that subtle nuance of difference might be in your question. And, and the only one that's coming to mind for me is this second point that you made about uh, behavioral economists and, and this idea that we're designing uh, for, for users who are predictably irrational. And, and this may be my own bias, but sometimes when, when I'm donning my design hat for whatever work I'm doing, I, I wonder if sometimes I'm trying to unearth patterns that might create some kind of inherent order or predictability. And, and that may be a place of subtle difference between uh, the, the mindsets of these two different fields that are so closely linked. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So 
I, I mean, I, I love that comment um, because I do think that it's important for all of us involved in design work to interrogate whether or not we are, without re realizing it, making assumptions about the rationality of those who will use the things that we produce. And even the, the idea that, you know, folks, um, this, this idea that you're raising about predictability, it may be kind of coming from that place of kind of assuming that if we build something that, that's really beautiful and it's really useful, that like people will use it, that, you know, it's gonna be attractive and there's gonna be a lot of take up. And that's why we have to test that assumption. It could be true, but it could also be that there these other behavioral bottlenecks come up and interfere. Um, I'm, I'm wondering when you look at this particular situation, you know, trying to increase the on-time payment, you know, full payments for folks who owe child support, do you see what, I mean, how do you think you would have approached answering this question or, you know, coming up with a solution? I know it's very hard to, to, um, to put yourself in our position because you have so much less information, but what, where, where do you think you would have, your mind would have gone and how would you have tried to solve for this, you know, coming up with the specific elements of the design? Well, I'm thinking um, for me from a kind of umbrella perspective, not necessarily the processes and methods, there's everyone else on this call is, is far more versed in that than I am uh, and, and more deeply in that work. But I, I had a buddy uh, who was uh, a, a political science uh, professor at Indiana. We were roommates in college and uh, he knows that I'm in the charter school world and I, I know he's in the political uh, science space and he posted something about, you know, that this is this is the problem with charter schools. They don't uh, they don't handle, you know, poverty in their communities, this, that, and the other something. And and I I, you know, talked to him back and said, well, we're kind of busy running schools. <laughs> hmm. so, so we're a little engaged in the work we're doing. And and the point to that uh, interchange between us that I think has bearing on this is. I wonder what other community institutions are a part of the systemic solution. So now we've gone on from the scale of the form and the training, the process to what's going on in those communities. Are there other community supports that are critical infrastructure pieces for transforming childcare payments that we, that we may not have even seen yet? And, and what processes it would take to get there, um, I'd love to hear from from the experts on that, of how you might go about creating that design experiment. So I love that as a um, way of thinking and because it wouldn't occur to those of us who work in the behavioral science space to, to go there. You know, our scope is really the program. It's the thing that we have mapped on our process map. And so, you know, if the, human centered design framework might, for example, open up space to start to think more about other systems, organizations that are touching the process that we're looking at and how we could um, intervene into those. I think that's really, really useful and really exciting to think about, you know, what that could look like. I also think to kind of tap into that too, comment of, of we, and to maybe steal a little from service design now, but this idea of convergence and di di convergence and divergence and mm -hmm. how do we kind of blow things out and come back in. But I would say a huge tenant, and Align is actually bringing this up too in the comments, but a big tenant of HCD is to me, and, and we can talk about this more, but I would say human-centered design and then what Maddie really tries to bring about and teach is maybe different than what they might do in another school. So we kind of have our own, our own stint on this, um, but that we want to have this kind of bigger picture and the topic or context. And then how do we dig into this hyper-local spot and how do we have those direct stories that help us tell the, to help tell, help pitch it too, so that we kind of get this more very, this, this um, emphasis on that human need that is there and not just what the problem is or what the goal is that we're trying to solve, but that it always goes back to the human behind it. So kind of like what Dee brought up too, of like even just reframing the context of how do we support 
you supporting your child instead of how do we ding you for messing up again? You know, like, mm -hmm. and how easily that is missed, that translation is missed and, and what that talks and what that comes to. I think a lot of stuff we also bring up that I personally try to hound a lot in our program is hospitality. And what does that look like when we have this angle of design that includes this hospitality around who we're de designing for, who we're designing with, and what that impact looks like on a larger level too. So anyway. Yeah, but this and this is cool because again, it's speaking to some of the ways in which these fields are sharing or you know drawing on each other. Um, so in in the behavioral science space, the concept of hospitality, as you put as you put it, is um, becoming more prominent. And like the use of the term customer instead of client is a real shift for the types of folks that we co-design with who often work in these you know, social service programs in, in government bureaucracies. So, you know, that becomes an opportunity for them. If these are customers, how might we serve them differently, you know? Um, so once again, I think that the, the key difference is, to, to Regina's point, it's this use of evidence. It's this idea that we might end up in the same place. From a customer service point of view, you need to tell people, you need to sit down and, have a human interaction and help a person who's stressed out, who may have limited resources to figure out how they're gonna meet this obligation. And so we probably all would have come up with the idea of a meeting, you know, one way or another, but what that specific content is and how much of it is built on existing research about plan making, um, you know, I think that's where the differentiator is. So, that leads me to, you know, my kind of conclusion here in terms of um, these two areas of design practice, what they share, the things that are in the middle, they both open a space for creativity in bureaucratic organizations. And that is, is radical and transformational in and of itself. You know, the, the ability to move away from a certain way of, for example, constructing a form and to turn it into an infographic it, uh, you know, which I will say they didn't, you know, many of the organizations we work with agencies did not even have the technology on their, on their PCs to create an infographic or print it, you know, um, with the way that they normally printed things like that is a really big deal that this design practice enables that kind of creative thinking. Um, both of these design practices open up a space for empathy in punitive organizations. They both open a space for experimentation in rule-bound organizations. And, but they differ importantly in that, in the sense of you know, using evidence. So behavioral economics very focused on using existing evidence as well as building an evidence base. So measuring the behavioral outcomes for the users to verify that our solution was a good one. And on the human centered design, and, and I'm going to say that I say that as a bit of a challenge to the human centered design bill, because I don't think that human centered design practitioners are doing enough of that to truly verify that that the outcome is um, what you had anticipated and is in the best interest of the, uh, the user. And then on the human centered design side, I think that that there's a real advantage in terms of opening space in organizations for sustainable change. Um, so one of the problems with the behavioral economics studies and tests is that we build so much um, research into it, it, it becomes a very um, distinct part of what an agency is doing. And when the study is over, even if it shows that these practices are beneficial, we, we haven't necessarily created a frame for the, the agency staff to continue to, to do the work. Um, whereas I feel like in human-centered design, especially with the prototyping piece, there's always this way in which what you're designing is very much embedded in what you're doing. And um, you know, it, it evolves in a way that's kind of more integrated into um, the way that the organization operates. So those are all my slides. And uh, yeah, we can uh, turn to our next segment. Yeah, so we have, this is great, Nadine. I think it's really interesting just to kind of 
see these different approaches and kind of what brings about different um, ideas and options and things like that. Um, and kind of these deep dives into these case studies. So I think one thing to me that kind of jumped out was this idea of like when we try to define and separate behavioral economics, service design, HCD, design thinking, like there's all these like terms that go about and it and it kind of sometimes I'm all, I'm just saying let's just do the work why do we have to have a term around it you know, let's just actually do the work and get and see where we can go and I think that then it, it makes it come back down to the process and the methods and kind of this attitude or approach we bring to the work and what that looks like um and I, I also think that this kind of to me there is a big shift in 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 the behavioral economics approach and kind of these like standard assumptions. And I would say Maddie and HCD, what we try to do is kind of surface those assumptions, but lead with the question that is so open-ended that we have to go find that evidence to guide us to the solution instead of starting with the what we hope to accomplish. And so I think there's kind of a balance there. And I think we could kind of learn from both of those approaches a little bit, but I would love kind of your thoughts on that assumption part too. Um, so first, I just want to I want to agree with your point about the different terms and you know kind of being able to get bogged down in all of these terms. I mean, what I think would be really an interesting project is for some graduate student to actually build the genealogical tree of design or creative problem solving and to put all the branches and to really label them um, because. I ignored a whole bunch, like, you know, the whole agile and lean six sigma and all of that, like that's in there somewhere, but it's, it's a little different from, you know, what we're doing. And so it really can get, it can get problematic because we can't create these silos. <clears throat> um, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I have a preference when it comes to design projects to start with an assumption that we need to find a measurable thing to solve. Um, that we that we have to be problem based in our work as opposed to opportunity focused. Because the fact is, we could redesign a lot of things to to sort of be better in 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 some way. You know, at least according to our own standards. There's a lot of opportunity for innovation within organizations. But I think sustainable innovation is where it you know happens when there's a problem and everybody recognizes it and we can map and we can measure it and then we attack it with our tools and that's when people are engaged in that process and they're satisfied by the outcome because they can see you know based on this this standard measurement that we have actually solved the problem um, and i think if we approach the design process with a more open-ended approach or framework it can it can be great you know but it can also lead to failing to identify the problem and to and the measurable problem that it is that we're trying to solve but that's my bias and that you know coming from, i'm an evaluator by training so if you ask me well, that question. and this is I <laughs> just to point out this is why we want people who have a different bias and a different approach in with our students and working and and why we have this program to come in and say what do you think? And how do we we bring in trusted advisors to come in and say, there's another way to look at this. And at the graduate level, we need to be critically um, evaluating what that looks like. So I think it's great. The one thing I will definitely agree with you on is how um, the HCD case studies and stories need to be told better. I mean, Maddie needs to do this better. I think in general, everyone needs to talk about the, the this approach to the work and how we've come with to innovative solutions and that whole process needs to be explained as well as a logo redesign for American Airlines. Like we mm. need to have that same beautiful storytelling um, for visual things as we do for social impact efforts and things like this, because I think we miss this. And, and I think we get to, I've part, my assumption is part of that is the nature of the people working on these projects are totally overwhelmed and have a million other things to do besides just tell the story. And I think funding has a lot to do with it. But I also think sometimes we shortchange ourselves to say, well, yeah, that's just how we do it, you know, and it doesn't, it's not as glamorous as we think some other maybe be visually beautiful thing can be. So I, I do think that concept of telling and implementing and, and really capturing the whole process and the impact is something we're missing.
but let's be clear, because you just said the word impact. And I and that is where, again, we need to have a structure built in to track the impact. It's easier for a commercial, you know, business that is building a product, you know, when uh, Steve Jobs and his crew used design thinking to, to create a mouse, you can just look at how many mouses are sold to figure out if it's having an impact. Whereas when it comes to improving educational outcomes or health outcomes, these are much more difficult um, outcomes to measure and much more important right? in, in, for, for the society. Yeah. So we do need to invest in building the infrastructure to be able to track whether or not we're having, we're moving the needle on, on those things too. Totally agree. Okay, we have about 10 minutes. Does anyone else have any other burning questions or ideas you wanna just jump, unmute and jump in on or throw into the chat? The framing. Can you tell us more? <laughs> I think the, 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 the feedback that's going through the chat and through the, the discussion seems to always frame on, and this is the right answer, like a silver bullet approach to a multi-pronged issue. I think when it comes to the, uh, we'll say child support thing, it's, you can almost like boil it down to, you have the money or you're unwilling to part with the money. But if you have the money, you know, maybe it's not, it's not the easiest way to, 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 spend, to contribute your portion. But if there's other things that are there, it doesn't seem to give way for that to be navigated. So if my issue is, I'm worried where the money will be spent or it's not gonna be given to the kids things. That also needs to be either addressed or at least adjudicated in a sense that, all right, well, give us some money and then we'll set up a court date for something. Mm. Because like when it comes to, like, if you're dealing with people, there's always more than just the answer you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's an important point. And I, I don't want to suggest that what we've presented, what I've presented in either of these cases is kind of the answer, it is an answer. It is one, it is the first step towards kind of rethinking the, the process by which these systems were delivering their services. But what's more important than that particular solution is A, that it started in a human-centered way. So, you know, you have the opportunity at that front end to really start to understand the universe that your customers are living in, all of the things that you know, they are worried about and thinking about. And that wasn't happening. It doesn't happen uh, at scale in government programs. So that creates an opportunity to build a process that is more humane and responsive to your customers. And again, um, what we've shown you is the first intervention, the kind of obvious intervention that these organizations should be doing. They the whole goal of this work is for the people who work in those systems day in and day out to continue to use human centered practices to continue to evolve and elaborate, you know, their manner of um, delivering services. And not all of that is going to be able to be tested. You know, we, you need, for example, a certain volume of cases to do a random assignment in, if we're trying to, you know, target, um, particular users based on race or income or geography, we just may not have the scale to do this type of experiment. And we should be okay with that. We should still measure, we should still hold ourselves accountable, but we can accept that, you know, we're not necessarily going to have a beautiful bar chart like this at the end. And that doesn't mean that the whole process was a failure. Um, so I think these are really important points and I haven't been tracking the uh, chat, but I appreciate um, the, you know, the clarification. So I wouldn't want you to leave with me, you know, thinking that I'm saying do this and only this. Yeah. I think too, one, one way we kind of slice and dice it is this concept of improving and not just solving because you're right. Like there is no silver bullet that will fix it, but it does like what Nadine's saying, it opens the door to saying this approach was really successful. And here, look at this, even these kind of quick wins to get us to more sustainable solutions, I think is all part of that process. So, um, okay. So we have just about Melody. five. Oh, go ahead. Nadine. Melody had something. 
Hi, thanks. Um, this is such an intriguing um, presentation. And again, I think that opening slide with the tree is so helpful because there is a lot of overlap, but I love what you've said about both open up the space for creativity and bureaucratic organizations. But as I'm hearing this, and I'm a novice, you know, I'm kind of an outsider looking in, many of you are already in this work. Um, it seems that on the behavioral economic side, that's an almost an easier win into bureaucratic organizations. And then once you do this very focused um, problem solving for the problem, that it almost seems like you might bring in um, the Maddies of the world, right? After or during the process um, to then do the extended quantification and human-centered design and conversations within other organizations or the other touch points for the people that you're working with. So I love, this is really hopeful because I think that some sometimes the, again, this is a novice, like the Mahdi programming can be so vast and you do come to extraordinary solutions, but it's sometimes I would imagine hard to explain that to organizations of how impactful you can be um, and that the sometimes the data centered folks will take to the behavioral economics first, and then you get to do this kind of slide in marriage um, for these solutions. So that's, that's just a really exciting takeaway from this presentation. Thanks to both of you. I love that you just framed the BE as the Trojan horse that you know, just brings <laughs> HCD into <laughs> organizations. Um, I think it's that's perfect because th there was a, something that I, I had plans for us to do this kind of more interactive piece that we're not going to have time for, and it was to try to to surface from you all how can these two approaches play together? What how do they contribute to each other? And to think about this, and I think you're absolutely right. There are things that are possible in the context of an experiment, especially when you tell people the experiment. First of all, the, the staff is going to have the opportunity to contribute to um, the design and that's that's helpful. But then we're only gonna have to do it for a few months. And then, you know, if it doesn't work, forget it. We're crazy. You know, the, those of us who think that you have to listen to your customers, like we're wacky, we might be totally wrong. We'll know. And then, you know, if we're if we see that there's an impact, we can talk about, you know, how to move forward. And so it does, it does create space where space did not exist. And you start to have these converts within government agencies who become really interested in service design and empathy for customers and, you know, just changing the framing of what they've been doing, which will no doubt have knock-on effects after, um, especially with the techniques that we're teaching. So, yeah, I love that. Um, okay, I'm going to end with one kind of wrap up question we got from a line. He asked, can you talk about how your experience is doing this work and your work and research and then Mary kind of coupled with your experiences in Maddie last semester, how that's kind of informed you moving forward? Oh, in so many ways. I mean, so I really do think of human centered design as the framework, the notion of being human centered in designing our, our everything. So would be it our strategies, our organizations, our processes, and we can bring that lens to anything that we're doing. Um, and in particular in philanthropy, where we have the opportunity to catalyze work that's happening in the community. I think, again, what we need to think about is how do we identify things to bet on that are human centered and problem based, you know, so we don't just want to have these these high quality conversations about changing the world, but really talk to practitioners who have observed, who have like tried things and, you know, have that level of expertise that they're bringing to the conversation about what's possible. And then, you know, we actually have incorporated a design process into our grant making. So we do make grants along the stages of, of human centered design from discovery through prototyping implementation um, evaluation and scale. Um, and, and that's just one easy way of talking about how you can kind of use the mindset to reform, you know, organizations or what you're doing. But again, I think there's so many opportunities for all of us to incorporate a human centered lens into, uh, into what we do. I love that. Um, 
Okay, so this is perfect timing. We're going to wrap up with a minute to spare. Um, and I just, Nadine, thank you so much for your time, your expertise, your your very um, constructive criticism with our students was just so thoughtful and so helpful. And I know our projects would not have been as good as they were if it weren't for your um, input and advice. So um, we learned, I learned a lot from you and I just thought it was just a really great experience and I hope you had a great time too. So thank you for all of that you, that you contributed to our program. Oh, thank you guys. I'm so happy that I'm now an official member of the Maddie family. You are in for life. I will um, be here. <laughs> thank you thank um, everybody thank you all my friends and, and colleagues and stuff who, who, who joined thank you carol everybody i really appreciate you guys i and i i miss to the students keep me in your rolodex i you know i really enjoyed working with you and i hope that we continue to be part of each other's networks absolutely so to kind of wrap this up um we if you are interested more in maddie or anything that we have going on we actually have an info session about enrollment this friday but we're doing them twice a month until april so check us out on smu.edu slash maddie m-a-d-i for any more information um, and then stay tuned we will have another designer in resident event probably in april with our new designer in resident this semester her name is rachel triska um, and our she is working on a project with our new client the dallas police department so uh, we have lots of big things coming up this semester so please stay in touch follow us on instagram linkedin and all of that goodness and i'm, I'm sure you will have more to hear from nadine in the future so thank you again nadine thank you everyone for sharing your afternoon with us and we will see you later bye everybody bye it looks like you're in your house i am <laughs>